Good afternoon. Welcome to the Board of Commissioners special call to our work session for November 24th, 2015. Our first tab is Cobb County Transportation Agency. We have two items. Director DeMassimo. Mr. Chairman, County Commissioners and County Manager, our first item is to present information regarding the Cobb Community Transit Route 10X Implementation Plan. Bill Ball, Chief Operating Officer of Tyndall Oliver & Associates will be presenting. Before he does, just a little background. Um, in the summer of 2013, the City of Marietta, in partnership with Southern Polytechnic Institute, now KSU, and Life University, completed a Livable Centers Initiative Study, and the study included a transportation recommendation to create a transit route focused on serving the universities, linking students and other patrons between downtown Atlanta and Cobb County. Um, also, as indicated in the agenda item on May 27, 2014, the board approved memorandums of agreement with SPSU and Life University to participate in the development and funding of the CCT Route 10X implementation plan, which we are going to be discussing today. In the fall of 2013, the department applied for and was awarded a federal grant to fund the uh, estimated operating cost of the 10X service for three years should the board authorize the proposed service to be implemented in the future. It includes CMAC <coughs> funds um, as well as other local match. Uh, we, the consultant has evaluated several transit service options relating to travel time, ridership potential, transit market coverage, demand for activity center connectivity, and overall cost. Look forward to sharing that with you today, and it was shared with the Transit Advisory Board last evening. Thank All right, before you. we get going, I forgot to do some little house cleaning. Commissioner Burrell. Oh. Commissioner, Commissioner I'm sorry, I, I was told it was Commissioner Burrell. I'm sorry. I didn't know Commissioner Cupid was coming. Okay, in. thank you. P appreciate that, Commissioner Burrell. I just wanted to share that today we have an honorary member of the Board of Commissioners who is here. Um, <laughs> we have Ms. Harper Keaton debuting at 10 weeks old today for us with the assistance of mom, Bianca Keaton. We are so happy to see you and babies. See how beautiful she is. We're glad okay. to put you both to work. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming Thanks and visiting for us here. today. Uh, uh, I like, forgot who you are. How can you compete with that? <laughs> <laughs> My apologies, sir. No problem. Again, just to remind you, my name is Bill Ball. I'm with Tyndall Oliver, and I've been working closely with staff and the Transit Advisory Board and the stakeholder group on, on the Route 10X implementation plan. What we wanted to do today is give you a briefing of the project, give you a sense of where we are, and, and answer any questions that you might have. This is what we're going to cover briefly in the presentation, stepping back to the objectives, a little bit about study area, and then what we did in terms of developing and evaluating alternatives coming up with the preferred alternative that we'll talk about today, and then some, some initial thoughts on the implementation plan. If you look at our project objectives, this is basically our charge was to lay out a, a, a more premium bus route that tries to accomplish these items on this slide. Number one is how do we reduce travel time on this corridor, US 41, uh, I-75 corridor, to make it a more competitive transit trip. Uh, number two, um, relates to can we help with the overcrowding of that's that occurs at certain times of the day on the current local route 10 number three is can we attract more choice riders can we get more people that have an automobile to choose to use the transit service with this more premium bus service um, number four is is uh, basically related to testing the viability of this type of service on a route here in, in in Cobb County and perhaps it has viability on other quarters if it makes sense on this particular route. And then number five, taking a look at if we were to establish Route 10X, what are the implications for this service on other routes in the system? This was the study area that we started with. It basically covers the from Kennesaw State University on the north all the way down through Marietta, through Cumberland into Midtown Atlanta. And, uh, you can see that we, we, we basically covered the I-75 US 41 Cobb Parkway corridor and, and looked at opportunities for providing a more competitive transit trip from, from length to length on that corridor. 
We started out with five initial alternatives that we evaluated. Um, won't go into all the details with these ex unless you have questions, but the basic goal was to balance mobility and access. Mobility being the fastest trip possible, access being providing access at certain stop locations along the corridor. And the more stops you provide, the less mobility you have, so it's a balance as we go through this premium bus analysis. And we looked at the operating characteristics of those initial alternatives. You see the, the, the frequencies and the hours of service that we assumed in the, in the initial evaluation. These were the evaluation criteria we used to take a look at those initial alternatives. Um, and they really tie back to those project objectives that I talked about in the earlier slide. Uh, travel time is perhaps the most important one, uh, followed by ridership, transit market, uh, connectivity, and cost. By connectivity between the major activity centers on our corridor study area, and then of course cost. Our initial evaluation resulted in the recommendation of actually alternative C, which was the one that's associated with the use of express lanes when they become available on I-75. Since they won't be here until perhaps the fall of 2018, our second highest alternative was alternative E. And we took alternative E and worked with the Transit Advisory Board, with the stakeholder group, and with staff to come up with some enhancements to that alternative that you see on this slide here. Uh, basically adding a couple of more stop locations and taking advantage of technology if the county decides to pursue uh, more signal priority technology for transit if you move in that direction. And then also the use of the HOV lane on I-75 from Makers Mill to and getting off at Northside, which is consistent with what you'll hear on the Route 10 here later in the, in the meeting today. To give you an illustration of that preferred alternative, this illustrates what we would serve in the stop locations. The, it would start at the Big Shanty Park and Ride to the north, travel down I-75, go over to the Marietta Transfer Center, uh, and then it would stay on Cobb Parkway for for, for a bit, stopping at KSU um, uh, Marietta, as well as uh, Windy Hill Road, and then down to the Cumberland Transfer Center, where it would get on the HOV at Acres Mill and head into down to Midtown Atlanta, uh, stopping at the Arts Center and then on to Midtown Station. And I will say that the, we, we made decisions about additional stations, locations, based on access to the universities that were, that were part of the stakeholder group in this process. So the Big Isle bus that is operated by KSU and Kennesaw would serve that already passes by the, the Big Shanty Park and Ride, so there's a connection there. And then all the way down at the, we went down to the, to the Midtown station because the Georgia Tech uh, bus shuttles would be able to provide that connection to, to the uh, Midtown station as well. And then of course we're serving uh, KSU and Marietta as well. Wanted to give you a sense of the travel time difference. If you were to travel the length of this corridor today, it would take you riding the 40, transferring to the Route 10. There's about 70 to 75 potential stops in the local bus route system. And that ride would take you about a, two hours, 120 minutes to go the length of the corridor. Uh, with the Route 10X, we would be able to reduce that to about 90 minutes. And we would be able to get you further into Midtown at the, mid, at the Midtown station. So we're saving about a half hour, uh, conservatively estimated. Tough to, to estimate travel times on that corridor given the congestion that occurs at different times of the day. But our best estimate is that you would save about a half hour if you travel the length of the corridor. Just briefly on the implementation plan, uh, the thought is to, to, to have the discussion with, with the commission today, come back in January with uh, looking for uh, adoption of the, of the, of the plan, and then uh, if we iron out the funding options, we could potentially order buses later in the spring if you decided to move forward with this service. With that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Good pre great presentation, actually. Is there any questions? Bill, uh, Commissioner? All right. Um, yes, thank you. Um, is there any discussion or consideration? Um, the board has been looking at the circulator plans. Um, I know that. The effort here is to try to have a more expeditious route from KSU downtown. Um, is there any thought about the, either the Cumberland Transfer Station or whatever having the circulators pass through there so if folks are on, kind of coming in on the circulator, they can hop on 10X? 
that would be my understanding is that that connection would occur with the with the Cumberland service that's that's planned for the future. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Excuse me. You yes, ma'am. Sir, you may have shared this um, with the 10x route. Are there going to be no stops between the Marta station and Big Shanty? It's just going to be one express. No. No. If you look back at the uh, the map. Mm -hmm. We have seven stop locations okay. indicated on this map, and they're labeled on this map. Okay. So you, you see Big Shanty is where it starts. Uh, then it would stop at Marietta Transfer Center. Then it would stop at KSU and Marietta. Okay. Then it would stop at Windy Hill Road. Uh, then the Cumberland <laughs> Transfer Center. Okay. Then Art Center, then Midtown it's just Station. Straight through from Cumberland. So seven locations versus if you looked at the, the routes that you take today, it's about 70 to 75 stops. Okay. How, how would access to Route 10 be different than Route 10X, say at the Cumberland Transfer Center? Could people hop on the 10X um, as opposed to the 10? Well, the advantage if you're traveling to, again, we pick these seven stations as stop locations on the 10X because they're the most heavily utilized of the, of the stop locations on mm -hmm. the 10 and the 40 today, mm -hmm. um, which means that if you're going to one of these locations, you would take the 10X to get there more quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if you're looking to get at stops in between, then you would still have the Route 10 available to you to get to those stops in between these major stations. So you would have the option of choosing which one works best for you. Okay, good. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Director. Your next item, please. Our next item is to present information regarding the Cobb Community Transit Route 10 performance evaluation. Glenn Waters, Senior Planner with Kinetics Transportation Group, uh, will be discussing the evaluation that was performed. Route 10 is one of several local routes currently operated by CCT. It is a route that experiences extremely heavy ridership loads. As you know, we've uh, talked, discussed with the board in the past that this is one of the highest volume bus routes in the southeastern United States. Very successful route. So uh, Glenn will be pr presenting the evaluation of uh, the route and making recommendations for improving its service operations. Thank you. Thank you, Faye. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the Commission. Uh, as Faye mentioned, my name is Glenn Waters, and I'm with Kinetics Transportation Group out of Roswell. And we are part of the Parsons Brinkerhoff team that has been providing an on time performance and capacity analysis of CC CCT's Route 10. For those of you that may not be familiar with Route 10, uh, the service is the workhorse of the CCT system, carrying nearly 1 million passenger trips, or just over 25% of CCT's overall system wide ridership. Um, every year. The service operates along Cobb Parkway between the Marietta Transfer Center and the Cumberland Transfer Center, um, just uh, adjacent to the Cumberland Mall. Uh, from there, the route continues south on US 41, crossing the Chattahoochee to I-75 to its final destination at Marta's Art Center Station. If you've driven through any portion of this route, you've likely noticed that traffic has been on the increase, particularly during the morning and afternoon rush hours. Of course, this has had a negative impact on Route 10's on-time performance, which has also created crowding conditions where buses are fully loaded with standees when traveling on the interstate. Our goal in this analysis is to identify the root causes and, um, of these issues and recommend swift, cost-effective corrective actions. Our approach has been very much data-driven, using both quantitative and qualitative inputs. Our team has conducted an inventory of every Route 10 trip for weekday and Saturday service. Thus, we have a pretty good idea of which stops are the most and least utilized. We also measured the actual arrival and departure times at each time point so that we could better understand the pace at which the bus travels through the corridor. Our team spent time at some of the major boarding points to observe loading patterns and impacts to crowding when a bus would arrive late. And finally, we interviewed CCT and administrative um, DOT staff from the frontline bus operations all the way to the administration to see if their perceptions were in line with the data that we received. The map you see is just a sample of some of the data that we produced. Um, each dot represents one of Route 10's bus stops. The purple dots are the least utilized, while the red dots are the most heavily utilized. 
you'll see the Marietta Transfer Center at the top, the Cumberland Transfer Center, and the Art Center Station each represent more than 300 boardings uh, per weekday. Honorable mention also goes to Windy Hill Road, where routes 10 and 15 connect, the stop near Target, and the stop on the western end of the, of the Cumberland Mall near Sears. As far as capacity is concerned, we learned that Route 10's demand falls somewhat outside of the traditional rush hour. Uh, we observe crowding starting closer to the 1 o'clock hour, while Route 10's frequency doesn't improve for the afternoon rush until about 2.30. Likewise, we also saw that the morning peak demand is much more concentrated, giving us room to reallocate trips to times when demand is greater. And finally, we saw firsthand the correlation between late buses and the crowding conditions on Route 10. Afternoons at Art Center are particularly vulnerable. Uh, when buses are able to maintain a consistent 15-minute frequency, the platform is, is cleared and the crowd slowly builds for the next bus. But we saw that when a bus arrived late, the crowding would swell to a point uh, that took nearly an hour to recover. So we're pretty well convinced that if the on-time performance can be repaired, then the overcrowding conditions will also be corrected. So what did we learn about Route 10's on-time performance? Uh, the upper end of the schedule is relative, relatively accurate um, and only needs a, fine, a little bit of fine-tuning. That would be the portion uh, between Marietta and Cumberland. We also found that there's a little bit of slack in the schedule on the approach into Cumberland. And fortunately, that slack can be shifted to the more volatile segment between Cumberland and Art Center Station. Now, the team looked at three approaches to correcting Route 10. The first was to maintain the service exactly as it operates today and simply add more buses to meet the necessary running times. This would have been the most costly option, plus it would not have addressed the variability in the I-75 traffic. The second option would modify the route to take advantage of the Acres Mill HOV ramp. Currently, Route 10 does not utilize the HOV lanes because of all the merging back and forth um, that needs to occur between the Northside Parkway ramp and 14th Street, where the uh, route currently enters and exits the interstate. Accessing the HOV lanes via Acres Mill would allow the bus to safely access the lanes without having to power across all of that traffic twice. Option three would also take advantage of the Acres Mill HOV ramp, but would also create a limited stop service where every other trip during the peak periods would only service the most popular five or six stops in the corridor. After reviewing the pros and cons with CCT and DOT staff, a modified version of option two was selected to move forward. This option would not only take advantage of the HOV access at Acres Mill Road, but would also utilize the HOV access point at Northside Drive in Atlanta. Doing so also creates potential for up to three stops in the Atlantic Station area. This alignment is consistent with the proposed Route 10X alignment that you just saw previously in the presentation. Uh, making it all the more seamless when that service is brought online. I should also point out that there are three stop pairings between Acres Mill and the Chattahoochee that would no longer be served by Route 10. However, they would still be served by Marta's Route 12. Each of these stops showed minimal boarding activity, and the directions of boardings and lighting suggest that those riders are bound for Marta anyway. Regardless, they will not be without transit service. So the map you see shows the recommended alignment. The route is, is the same as it is today between Marietta and Cumberland Boulevard. We'll, we'll turn a block early to make its way to the transit center. From there, it continues across Acres Mill Road to I-75, exiting at Northside Drive, and then across 17th Street to Art Center Station. As far as the Route 10 schedule goes, We'll be consolidating two time points to better accommodate connections at Windy Hill Road. Running times will be adjusted to reflect today's conditions. The morning and afternoon peak periods will be adjusted to better fit with demand, plus a special trip will be added in the mornings to accommodate the heavy 7.30, um, 7.30 a.m. ridership. Fortunately, we're able to maintain the same number of buses, except for the afternoon when traffic is at its worst. During those times, another bus 
and another, another 15 minutes will be added to the schedule. Because we were able to shift resources from underutilized periods, the estimated cost increase to correct Route 10 is just over $68,000 annually. Most of that cost is attributed to the extra bus in the afternoons. Now throughout this project, our goal has been to fix Route 10 and fix it fast. We have a few more steps to make that happen, but we're on track to implement the service adjustment with the May market next spring. So that concludes my presentation, and I'll take questions. Good job, Glenn. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Can you uh, share how, excuse me. Yes. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good, good, good. Good, good to see you again. Good, Yes, likewise. Appreciate all of your work with the FLEX system and see the improvements in the area. I'm curious to know what the addition of the bus and the PM um, trip, you stated that um, the route was extremely volatile and difficult to predict. How does adding another bus help to reduce that? It gives us a little bit time? extra recovery time. Mm -hmm. um, right now, those, it takes about two hours to run the route which means it doesn't give you any extra time to load at the end of the line or for any hiccup or delay in, in um, travel to occur. Mm. It's just the scheduled travel time in the afternoon is a flat one hour out and one hour back. Mm. So adding that 15 minutes gives you a little bit of a buffer. Okay. Typically you want to put about 15% recovery time mm -hmm. or layover time in a schedule just to allow for those unexpected things that occur. Okay. It's like wheelchair boardings, other things that delay the route. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Glenn. Good, good job. Thank you, Director. That concludes your time. Correct. Um, would you be kind enough to send these powerpoints to each of the commissioners? Thank you so much. That takes us to tab two, Human Resources, Mr. Hagler. Good afternoon, Chairman, Commissioners. Um, we started a pay study with the Archer Group um, that was initiated in August of 2014, and we've asked the principal for the group to come address the board as to the status of the study, Chip King, so he's here to make a presentation to the board. Thank you. Mr. King. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Archer Company, uh, I appreciate the invitation to come and give you all a, a hopefully brief update on where we've been with the class and comp study uh, and to prepare you for the uh, steps ahead uh, with our timeline uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, I apologize that I'm not quite as uh, attractive as the Commissioner of Honor today, the, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I hope you can uh, bear with me for a little while. Uh, my name is Chip King. I'm with the Archer Company. I am the project manager for the study. Uh, I guess I do have a thank you. Uh, regarding uh, the purpose and the overview, I've got to want to spend just a brief uh, period of time reminding you a little bit of what we're trying to accomplish and how we're getting there, uh, culminating with uh, a progress report, an update of what we've accomplished and uh, where we uh, anticipate being for the next couple of uh, weeks ahead. Uh, if you look at the purpose of the study, uh, really uh, when we do a comprehensive classification and compensation study, there's two questions that we're trying to ascertain. One, when we look at all the positions, are they properly classified according to the complexity of the work and the duties and responsibilities of the jobs? Uh, are the classifications uh, ranked and placed into your pay plan in accordance with the value uh, that those positions have in the organization. Uh, that's what we call internal equity. Uh, and then the second question has to do with the competitiveness of the pay plan, of the county's pay plan in the market, uh, which of course speaks directly to your ability to uh, recruit and retain talent. Uh, and so the focus of the study is primarily there. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, individual components a lot of pieces to the study, but that is the primary, um, those are the two primary questions that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, if you look briefly at internal equity, it's an analysis of all of the positions in the organization. Uh, this study was comprehensive. It includes all of the positions. 
uh, both those uh, underneath the Board of Commissioners, but also those in the constitutional offices as well. Um, and looking individually at every position, we'll be making recommendations for the proper classification of the positions, uh, and ultimately we'll be making determinations for proper pay grade placement of each of those positions. Um, it's important for you all to know and understand that when it comes to pay grade recommendations, uh, there is a very objective and valid process that we use uh, to make those determinations because, of course, where you fall into a pay grade has a direct impact on the value of that position and how you pay employees. So it's important that there's a correlation between the value of that position in the organization uh, to uh, the, the level of pay that you set for it. Uh, internal equity is very critical in the process to make sure that there's fairness within the county, looking across departments, looking across positions, uh, to make sure that you've got uh, some fairness in the way pay is set from the pay plan perspective. And so internal equity is a very important part of this process, and job evaluation is a key element of that. Uh, I won't bore you with great details. If you all do have questions, I'll be glad to spell it out in a little bit more uh, detail. But basically, the evaluation process is a means by which we can objectively uh, determine that process for you, determine those uh, relative rankings. Uh, up on the slide also is an overview of our methodology for the market analysis. Uh, when we do a competitive analysis of your market, basically we're talking about a salary survey. Uh, we uh, first start by identifying who the peer organizations that uh, would best represent uh, this, uh, this county. Uh, we look at uh, establishing benchmarks uh, that are representative of the pay plan overall. Uh, and then we compile data to determine what the prevailing wages are for similar positions in the peer organizations that uh, can be said to reflect the market data for each classification. Uh, it's a benchmark process. We don't gather market data on every classification in the county. Uh, that's more of a logistical um, uh, process. Uh, there's a reason, the reason for that is mostly logistical. Uh, it becomes very tedious to try to gather market data on every single position, every single classification. Uh, but if you choose your benchmarks properly and you look for jobs that are representative of the organization across uh, the board, uh, you can find that the uh, market data you collect for your benchmark data is, is very representative of the county's pay plan across the board. Uh, you can see from this that we took uh, kind of a three-pronged approach. Uh, we looked primarily at Metropolitan Atlanta as being your, your main competitive base. Uh, and to represent uh, the, the metropolitan Atlanta area, we focused uh, primarily on the large organizations. I'll list them for you in just a minute. Uh, but we did also survey a regional base as well to make sure that we got the flavor of larger governments in the southeast uh, to make sure that we weren't missing anything in uh, Cobb's relation to metropolitan Atlanta uh, and the size and nature of the government. Uh, we also are looking at published data to capture the flavor of the private market as well. Uh, so that three-pronged approach should uh, serve us pretty well in our representative findings for the county. Uh, part of the market analysis, of course, is also a uh, benefits analysis. Uh, we're working on that and we'll uh, be completing it very soon. Once we have the internal equity uh, established, the all the positions have been reviewed, classified, and placed into to pay grades. Uh, and then we have benchmark data representing the competitive market uh, for our benchmark positions. Uh, we go about the process of developing a pay plan that blends elements of both of those, uh, both sides of that equation. Uh, the, the, the goal here is to have a pay plan that balances internal equity concerns with market competitiveness issues. And as we go about doing it, uh, we attempt to customize the pay plan in a way that best reflects this organization. Uh, so when we look at developing pay plan recommendations for Cobb County, we're looking at um, how we define the market within which you compete, uh, where the county wants to be relative to that market. Do you want to be a lead, uh, leading organization? Is it enough to keep up? Uh, how, do you, how do you see yourselves relative to your peers in, in the market that we define? Uh, and then, of course, we're looking at things like pay grade structure, pay range structure um, to determine the best blend of a pay plan 
recommendations that will serve the county uh, and then ultimately uh, will terminate in implementation recommendations as to how you implement and move forward. Uh, again, the concept there is a balance between the two. So you'll see uh, a mix of making sure that the pay plan is competitive across the board, but also that it addresses internal issues. As we work through this, the end result of the study should be that you have a pay plan that represents up-to-date classifications, uh, that positions are properly classified based on duties, responsibilities, and, and complexity of the job. Uh, the pay plan will reflect the desired level of competitiveness that Cobb County wants to maintain in the market. Um, and then ultimately, uh, in relation to that, you'll have things like new class specs, uh, recommendations for the benefits package, uh, and a pay plan that addresses all these positions. Uh, it's an important uh, thing to, to mention here as we get towards the end of the study, of course. Uh, employees start to perk up and uh, pay particular attention. It's a good opportunity to uh, remind the board and to remind uh, the county population as a whole um, what we said at the very beginning of this process. Anytime you do a pay study, obviously you're looking at pay. We're trying to make recommendations relative to the structure and classification of positions. Uh, but it's important uh, that you all know that we've attempted throughout this process to communicate to employees that there are no guarantees. Uh, obviously, we're looking at pay as part of this process, but it may or may not result in an increase uh, for employees as we go forward. And I think that's an important thing to uh, just take a moment to, um, uh, to reflect in, in this presentation. Uh, there are no guarantees in this process, uh, but we are going to make sure that uh, recommendations are fair. Uh, that they're objective and valid as we move forward. A little bit about where we've been uh, and what we're up to as we uh, round uh, what I hope is the, uh, the downhill portion of the study. Um, the original targeted completion of this project was December 2015. Uh, we are behind schedule on that, but we are working uh, as rapidly as we can to catch up. Uh, we've got a revised schedule that uh, should bring the uh, recommended pay plan to the board late February with uh, the expectation or the, the ask that you'll take action of it in March. Uh, so everything that we've done uh, in the revised timeline is moving towards that direction. Of course, throughout this process, when you see project management, it's just a reminder that we've been meeting with various stakeholders throughout the process uh, to keep in touch and to uh, gather information along the way. Uh, that includes multiple meetings with the Oversight Committee and multiple meetings with the Compensation Committee uh, at various points. Uh, we're probably due for a meeting with the Oversight Committee, so I'll work with uh, Tony to get something scheduled. Um, part of the process uh, initially included an employee satisfaction survey, which we have done a lot of work on preparing. Uh, right now it's on hold, uh, and we're going to work on finishing the results of the paying class study. From an internal equity standpoint, uh, we've received and analyzed over 3,000 questionnaires from all the employees. Uh, that represents the bulk of the uh, 5, 000, roughly 5,000 employees, uh, as many questionnaires cover multiple positions. Uh, obviously, there are some positions for which we've had to go back and get additional information and follow-up for, uh, and we've been working on that as we go. Uh, at various times, we've met with the department heads to review operations, uh, to obtain an understanding of, of uh, how they work and their reporting structures, uh, and to get their feedback relative to the classification and compensation uh, study and how it will impact their department. Uh, we've spent a lot of time employ, uh, doing employee interviews. We've still got, uh, uh, that's probably the one area that we're farthest behind in, and we look to catch up on that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I've committed to Tony to... Uh, uh, getting those completed uh, this month in the first couple of weeks of December. Um, we have completed uh, questionnaires, and I'm sorry, interviews in about a third of the departments, including public safety and the ones you see listed, uh, DOT, water, and some others. Um, next on that list will be parks and recreation, some of the courts, and then we'll start uh, uh, focusing on other departments as well. Um, uh, throughout this process, as we classify the positions, we were working on the job evaluations to uh, piece the internal equity uh, recommendations together. Uh, we have established a preliminary grade structure, which we're testing internally to make sure it's going to work uh, across all, or, all aspects of the organization. It's going to 
uh, meet the needs of this uh, of the county moving forward, uh, and we'll be bringing that to uh, uh, to the county for review in January. We've completed uh, initial, the, the major portion of the market analysis. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're focusing on benchmarks. We've identified about 170 benchmarks that we've worked from, uh, and we're utilizing uh, data from those three levels that we talked about, locally, regionally, and then private sector. Uh, when we look at the 170 benchmarks, uh, we're focusing on metropolitan Atlanta as being the primary competitive base. Uh, for all of the benchmarks in the county across the board. Uh, but when it comes to looking from a regional basis, uh, we're focused more on management uh, type positions, senior level professional type positions uh, to reflect the, the competitive nature of those positions on a more regional basis. Uh, and then, of course, we are factoring in private sector data as we go. I've got the organizations listed here. Uh, on the left-hand side would be the, the local market representing metropolitan Atlanta. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see the five organizations that we surveyed regionally for um, the management and executive level positions, uh, and then just a, a nod to the uh, Economic Research Institute, which is our source for private sector data as well. High level, oh. there we go, I moved too soon. High level, uh, the preliminary findings in, in the market so far, and, and before I go through this, I do want to just put a couple disclaimers in here. Obviously, this is a work in progress. Uh, even as uh, we were working last week, uh, several of the organizations uh, have adopted new pay ranges just in the last, uh, uh, in the last couple of weeks, uh, so we've got to go back and update our data to reflect some of the competitors on this list uh, and to... Uh, uh, comb through the data one more time to make sure that we're making accurate comparisons across the board. Um, the other thing I want to, uh, to, to disclaim in this, in our preliminary findings, is the fact that uh, I'm speaking very broad generalizations, uh, so that uh, for, your, for, for, for your benefit, uh, to give you kind of an idea, preview of where we're at and what to expect as we move forward, um, but I caution uh, anybody that might see this presentation and try to try to make individual predictions as to what's going to happen to his or her uh, pay range, his or her salary, uh, we're just not at that point where those those types of predictions can be made. So please accept these as kind of broad generalizations of what we think we're finding in the market, uh, and and kind of a foreshadowing, if you will, of what we expect to happen in the pay plan. Generally, what we're finding is your pay ranges. Uh, while many of the pay ranges are, are generally in line with market, a fair number of them are, are lagging slightly behind market, um, probably 5 to 10%. Uh, but when we look at the actual pay of individuals uh, on a very high level across the board, generally the pay of individual employees on average falls within the market. There are groups and, and categories and job families where that differs a little bit. Um, but generally speaking, we expect to see uh, the pay ranges come up a little bit, uh, which may or may not impact the, the salary of individuals uh, in the pay ranges. Uh, specifically, at the low end of the pay plan, your lowest grades uh, is probably where we're seeing uh, one of the bigger differences, 10 to 20 percent below. Uh, a lot of this has to do with changes in the market right now as we speak. Uh, things uh, such as the economy picking up in construction, uh, booming in the area and, and uh, peer organizations starting to make, uh, to have movement in their pay plans is impacting competitiveness on the low end. Um, when we look at positions like public safety, you're generally at market, in some cases slightly above market. Uh, what we find in public safety, in the public safety arena is that there is a very uh, narrow margin, if you will, for a lot of the key positions in public safety. Uh, the peer organizations in metropolitan Atlanta keep very close tabs on one another, uh, and generally we don't find huge differences from one organization to the next. Uh, but there are some changes coming uh, in, in the uh, next couple of months as uh, DeCab and Fulton and I think Gwinnett uh, make some moves in their plan and some of the uh, local cities as well. Uh, so we are seeing some movement there. Uh, some of the 
technical and specialized positions in your pay plan uh, we're finding are generally uh, more significantly below market uh, on the neighborhood of 10 to 15 percent. Again, any individual classification may vary slightly from that number. There are certainly exceptions. Uh, but generally, we're finding that uh, those areas are lagging the market, uh, and we expect actual pay uh, on average uh, to, to be impacted by the ranges as it's falling below market. Um, whereas upper-level professional uh, positions seem to be generally in line with market uh, at the entry level or low level of those series of those job families, we're finding uh, a little bit of a lag behind market, uh, 10 to 15 percent. Um, it varies a little bit from classification to classification, department to department as to where pay falls within that market rate, but we're seeing that on average it's falling at the minimum of the level of the market. Uh, so we may need, need to make some adjustments there. Uh, and then generally speaking, your mid-level management to executive level management uh, also falls uh, on the neighborhood of 15 to 25% below market. Um, if you think about that for a second, uh, a lot of that has to do with the peer organizations uh, we're comparing you to. Uh, Cobb is uh, considered one of the larger, uh, more progressive of the uh, counties in, in metropolitan Atlanta. Uh, but you are also on the small side of the other organizations uh, compared to Fulton, Atlanta, and uh, DeKalb. Uh, and so when we make those types of comparisons, obviously some of that may be due to um, size of organization. It may do, be due to um, location, being inside the perimeter versus outside the perimeter. Uh, and it may also have uh, uh, to do with uh, decisions that other organizations have made politically in terms of where they are competitively in this market. Uh, but we are finding uh, uh, at a high level that uh, that pay is falling below market as well. Uh, if I didn't mention anything, uh, any specific group, uh, it's just because there wasn't uh, dramatic findings one way or the other. Uh, again, some of your positions are at or above market, some of them are below, we expect to find that. Uh, and then just uh, as we move forward, it's a reminder that uh, we're not trying to pinpoint the market placement of any one particular position as much as we're trying to capture Cobb County's position in the market as a whole taken across all of the benchmark positions. And so we'll craft a pay line uh, that is reflective of the market trends as opposed to trying to chase uh, specific dollar values for any one particular classification. In terms of where we are in moving forward, um, at the bottom of the timeline, uh, you'll see that we are aiming to bring uh, the findings to the Board of Commissioners uh, at your meeting on February 23rd, asking for action, uh, hopefully adoption and approval in March, I believe that's March 8th, uh, which means we're pacing ourselves in December and January uh, in February to meet those marks. Uh, so we'll continue working on interviews in December. Uh, we'll, we'll continue our work on draft internal equity in December, and that will carry over into January. Uh, the market analysis is, the data is largely compiled, but as I said, we need to go back and do some updates to the data, uh, and we need to do one more comb through um, and finalize our analysis of benefits. Uh, we'll be working on developing the draft pay plan um, in January and February, bringing it to key stakeholders in February for review, uh, and then ultimately to the Board of Commissioners. So that's our timeline, a uh, little bit about where we've been and uh, what we've been up to. Uh, and with that, I will yield, yield any questions or uh, let you have the rest of your afternoon. Thank you, sir. Did the Board have any questions in particular? Pardon me? Yes, I did. Yes, I had some questions. Um, the first question I have is with respect to methodology. Um, it was a um, slide seven. Right now, you're collecting data from employees and departments, and you're assessing that. Um, to ensure internal equity, and you're also assessing that with um, outside organizations to benchmark with them. 
And then there's a second portion here. He says the pay plan is customized to fit the client's unique culture, operational needs, management style, and compensation philosophy. How is that assessed? What do you look for? A combination of things. Um, a lot of it comes through uh, the preliminary discussions that we have with management and stakeholders at the beginning of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it has to do with understanding Cobb and where you traditionally have been relative to the market and who you are as an employer. Uh, some of it is going to come at the end as we begin to present findings and get feedback uh, first at HR and, and county management level of HR and county management level, mm -hmm. feedback from the oversight committee as well, uh, but then ultimately as it comes to you all as a board in terms of fine tuning any, uh, uh, any findings or recommendations that we have. So it comes from a variety of different places uh, and has been kind of cumulative as we've gone along. Okay. So you'll be communicating with the commissioners to also find out what our perspective is on that prior to you presenting something publicly? Um, uh, yes, ma'am. I'll, I'll work through county management to figure out the best way to get that, uh, solicit that feedback and input, but we can definitely do that. Okay, thank you. Also wanted to um, ask about the employee satisfaction study, which you provided will follow the presentation in March on the pay and class study. Um, how does the employee satisfaction study dovetail into what you're doing? I mean, uh, it's really a parallel process. Um, if you go back to how that, uh, that process was undertaking, uh, the original contract was for a classification compensation study, uh, but the county was looking at the, the possibility or the potential of doing an employee satisfaction survey. I believe that was on the recommendation of the uh, compensation committee. Okay. Uh, and they, they correspond very nicely. Uh, at the same time, they're kind of two separate things, so one doesn't impact the other, okay. uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but what it will do is if you move forward with the satisfaction survey, it's, it's more than just compensation related, uh, but it's a vehicle by which you can get feedback and input from employees uh, regarding things that are important uh, in their employment uh, at Cobb County. Okay. When do you assess that we'll get that? Um, the results of that survey? Uh, that uh, process, I think, will have to be worked out. It's to be determined. Uh, we haven't actually uh, released the survey yet. Uh, I think the focus uh, from oh, management... the employees haven't taken it yet. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. I think the focus has been shifted more towards the classification compensation piece uh, with uh, the idea that we'll come back and look at the survey uh, when we get through the bulk of the study. Okay. And then... Um, one final general question. I know this is referred to as a pay in class study, which may highlight wages, but certainly the compensation packages include other benefits. Yes, ma'am. So as you're assessing the, um, the different um, pay of various positions, are we looking at the entire compensation package? Because our pay might be lower, but we, we might offer something else um, above and beyond when it comes to other benefits. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, benefits, uh, what we call benefits analysis, mm -hmm. uh, is a key piece of the process in terms of our market assessment. Generally, what you'll find as we approach uh, compensation uh, and, and wage and salary uh, from, a, from a, uh, one aspect and approach benefits of the other, uh, sometimes organizations want to come up with some fancy formula that says X number of salary dollars equals X points in a benefits package. But generally what we find is that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, what we strive to do is make recommendations on both fronts so that if you're competitive in the market with your pay ranges and you're competitive in the market with your uh, benefits, generally overall compensation will be competitive. We're in the process of doing the benefits piece now. A okay. um, little early to give you specific results, but, but broadly speaking, uh, what we've found is that your benefits package is largely competitive with the rest of the market. Okay. Uh, we generally don't find a lot of variation um, from one peer local government to another. Okay. Uh, the bigger differences are going to fit within um, the county relative to private sector employers and things like that. Uh, but generally, re relative to most of your peers, um, there's a few tweaks here and there that will, will uh, come to light. But broadly speaking, your, your benefits package is fairly competitive. So at the end, as we uh, develop a pay plan with competitive pay ranges, make recommendations uh, and give you findings on the benefits package, mm -hmm. collectively total compensation should work uh, pretty well. And then, of course, there's always those 
um, intangible things like quality of life in Cobb County and uh, the, the, uh, the desire that, that employees have to work here versus other organizations. Um, you know, when you're competing with Atlanta and Fulton County, there's uh, factors such as commute time and things like that that, that are uh, that we won't obviously capture in that type of process, but speak to who you are as an employer. Okay, are those um, things addressed in the employee SAT survey at all? Um, some of those are, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Weatherford. The survey, do you not think that some of those questions would impact the pay and class study? I mean, do you not think that's important to know what our employees are thinking as far as benefits or pay or management style or the cobway or anything? I mean, it seems to me that these two should go hand in hand. Uh, I think they do go hand in hand in terms of how you maintain the pay plan over time and how you implement it moving forward. At the end of the day, classification and compensation is fairly direct and straightforward. You want to make sure positions are properly classified based on the jobs that they're performing. Uh, and that's job specific. It, it's uh, taking the employee out of the equation and looking at what that job requires. And so from that standpoint, employee satisfaction really doesn't factor in there. It's more of a question of, is that job properly classified according to the work that you're asking that position to do? And is that position, is that classification ranked according to the complexity and the value of that job to the organization? Uh, and then from the other component, of course, it's competitive in the market. Uh, what I think the, the satisfaction survey will address uh, down the road as you, you implement and maintain the plan overall. It will give you feedback in terms of some of those things. Uh, certainly it does address things like uh, compensation uh, and benefits. There's a section on that as well. But it also speaks to things like management and leadership and feedback from, uh, from all levels of the county uh, to satisfaction in the job and things like that. So it, it does go hand in hand. Uh, one is not dependent upon the other because at the end of the day, you've got to have a pay plan uh, that is fair, that is competitive um, across the board. Uh, and from there, uh, the feedback really gives you uh, ongoing, um, an ongoing pulse of the employees, if you will, in terms of how well it's received and issues they may have. Well, I understand that from a technology or a technical standpoint and a methodology standpoint, but from a board standpoint, from my decision making, this board's decision making, well, it's if important I could, to know that. I think. If I could address this, um, the t distribution of the survey is a separate, so total separate component, if you would, from the paying class study. It's a paying class study, which we started, and then compensation committee also felt that it would be advantageous for the board and management team to know the opinions of the individual uh, employee as it relates to things that are not as tangible as what's being addressed in the class and pay study. So yes, they are both between employee and employer, and employee and a management, but the purpose of the paying class <coughs> study is to just do that, look at the characteristics associated with each of the <coughs> the parameters in which the job operates, not the person. The survey has to do with the relationships with the, the folks that are associated with it. Mr. County Manager, would you agree with that in terms um, of what we're trying to accomplish? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, and when we look at uh, that component from the employee satisfaction, it gives you an idea of what we need to bring back to the board to remain competitive in condition with the class and pay study, i.e. educational pay, i.e. pension, i.e. whatever. That comes back to be, we'll have to address that going forward in the future. Yeah. I think I understand that, Mr. Chairman. I think what I was trying to say is that I think this board has a component that is missing when we make decisions on paying class study because employee satisfaction to me is a great part of why people work here, why people stay here. And, you know, we're going to be asked to make a decision on paying class before we have a survey. Is that correct? No. You're, you're, we, we could talk about this more at length earlier, but I think you're, you're, the, the, the classification and compensation study is an analytical perspective. No, I understand that. Yeah. The other is more of an analytical, um, or not analytical, more of a subjective opinion piece as to how people feel about where they're at. Right. Okay. So... We need to make sure our machine is running mechanically correct through the classification compensation study and then find out 
concurrently, but almost independently in how the attitudes are associated with where they work. Okay. And so we, they're both very important to do, and they're both very important to look into relative to each other, but one shouldn't play into the creation of the other, only because that, 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 and that takes an individual who may be, doing, may be either dissatisfied with his current position or that same position where the individual may be very happy with this situation, and that impacts our technical perspective of how we are competitive from the technical perspective. So that has to be there, but it doesn't have to necessarily, they don't necessarily have to be codependent on each other. And that's, I think, what, did I say that a different way? Um, no, I believe you've, you've addressed it very well. Um, generally speaking, uh, in actuality, Cobb is among a relatively small number of local governments that actually uh, is pursuing and looking at this concept of employee survey. It does happen in other markets, but it's not common. Um, uh, it's, it's, so I say that to speak, it'll provide you additional information moving forward that I think will be very valuable to the board in terms of your interaction with employees and your relationship to the employees. Uh, it is not a critical path through which the classification and compensation study needs to get uh, developed and implemented. Uh, it's more of a tool that you have at your disposal moving forward uh, after you get something in place, how you maintain it over time, uh, and how you react and respond to issues of the employees uh, will give you uh, valuable information down the road. Uh, but it's not a critical path towards uh, adopting a pay plan. You have a approximate timeline for the survey to be completed? I, at this time, I do not, but I'm sure we can uh, get something. That's being driven by the compensation committee. Thank you. Pay for it. Any other comments? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Look forward to this. It's an aggressive schedule. Let's try to keep up to it. Do our best. Thank you. Tab three, finance. Good afternoon, Bill. Good afternoon, Chairman, Commissioners, County Manager. I'm here today to present a brief update on priority based budgeting. And thanks, sir. Back in 2013, when we began the implementation of this, um, I, in the presentation here, I have a list of the municipalities throughout the U.S. that have either begun implemented implementation or fully implemented this and at the time in 2013 there were only five counties in the nation that had begun this process this is this process is dominated by cities due to the complexity of the process and the more more briefly the the simplicity of the cities versus the county structure so this is a, a massive undertaking being that only five counties in the nation have begun this and only two in the state of Georgia, city of Roswell, and Cobb County. Okay. This process is broken down into two strategic initiatives, fiscal health, which Cobb has been doing for years. This is part of our existing plan that we've had in place, our existing budgeting process, and our existing finance methodology that we currently use. The long-term fiscal health is really what we're referring to when we talk about priority-based budgeting. The most important part of this presentation that I would like you to walk away with is some examples of what priority-based budgeting is and what it is not. Priority-based budgeting is a framework to align county services with citizen priorities. It's a tool to examine asset reallocation. It is a tool that assists the decision-making process by fundamentally, fundamentally altering how budget dis discussions take place. It is a tool that answers the following strategic questions. What are we in business to do? What exactly do we do? How do we figure out what is core or what is the highest importance? How do we know we are successful? How do we ask better questions that lead to better decisions about what we do and why we do it? What priority-based budgeting is not? It is not a budget cutting tool. It is not an instrument that will determine level of funding or level of service for a program. It is not a complete overhaul of the current budget process. It is a dual process. It is not a model that will solve every budget decision or problem or decision. It will only shape our discussions as we move forward. 
This process is broken down into five steps. Determining results, clarifying result definitions, identifying programs and services, value programs based on results, allocating resources based on priorities. <coughs> the first three steps have all been completed by the county. Determining results was completed in December of 2013. The results is what we're in business to achieve. And the second part of this, which will come in the future, is a citizen engagement component, which we will go back and validate the results that the county has prepared and compare those with the citizens' priorities as well. But that will come in the future. The second, second step is clarifying the result de definitions. We created result maps detailing the factors that influence the way results are achieved. Specifically, one of our results is safe and secure community and we further defined what exactly that means to have safe and secure community. Step three, we have identified the programs and services, and that was completed in June of 2014. Currently, Cobb has approximately 2,800 programs, and that is, a, that is a lot. As we move into the later stages of this process, such as scoring and costing, we should see program consolidation. The last two steps, four and five, are yet to be completed, but we're currently and fully engaged in step four, valuing programs based on results. This is, we're valuing these programs based on how they influence the county and achieving the results that we have identified. This is broken down into two steps, self-scoring, which departments score their own programs, and then they go through a peer review process with outside departments looking at their scores. The final step, is allocating resources based on the priorities. Once we've completed our, our scoring, we'll present that information to our consultants, we, the Center of Priority-Based Budgeting. They'll pr provide us with a diagnostic tool that we hope to present to the board in April of 2016. We do anticipate this being included in the budget discussions for our next biennial budget. And lastly, how it benefits the taxpayers. This maximizes the benefit of every tax dollar collected by aligning it with the citizens' programs or currently the county's programs, which will be further compared against the citizens' priorities and ensures that every dollar spent is being evaluated against Cobb residents' priorities, which will, which will also happen when we further engage with the citizen engagement piece. At this time, I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Bill. The board have any questions? Um, will you email us this presentation? Yes, ma'am. And where are we in the process of all the departments giving their input? We have completed the program inventory, which all the departments have provided, and now we're in the scoring phase, which they go through every pro program that they've identified, and they match it up with the results of the uh, that we've identified, basically the goals of the county, and they receive a score based on each one of those criteria. So we're basically in the self-scoring process, and then we'll move into the peer review process. Okay. So the final two steps are where we're at. So we're, you've done, we've been involved with this about three years, two years? We started in late 2013. So we've done a lot of work in a short period of time. Yes, sir. Relative to everything else that's been going on in this last couple of years. So I want to give a shout out to you and your team and Jim and his leadership, but also uh, to all the employees that have participated in getting this program moving forward uh, on top of what they've already been doing. And that's been Absolutely, sir. And, and we, we can take very little credit. Most of the work has really been performed by the departments, and we really appreciate their involvement and their, their help in the process. Yes, we, yes, do we. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I have a question regarding the citizen engagement piece. When is that expected to occur? Um, we haven't determined exactly with the time frame of completion. Typically what we've seen from other uh, counties and municipalities that have implemented this is they go through the whole process internally first and okay. then within a year or two, possibly three years after completion and having more data, mm -hmm. they go back and they use the citizen engagement component. And then we've seen other, other uh, municipalities do the citizen engagement component up front. So we've seen it a variety of different ways. Okay. And um, after discussion with the county manager and uh, some of the uh, presentations we've been to, 
we felt it would be better to do the internal implementation first and okay. then reach out to the citizens afterwards. Okay, so the April deadline is just the internal deadline. The, exactly, the internal implementation. Okay, can you go back to that timeline for a brief second? Sure. Sorry, I just want to look at. Um, slide eight, steps to C6. So we, okay. we, we are in the value, uh, valuing programs results, or valuing programs based on results, and we anticipate that the self-scoring being, being completed in February of 16. Okay. The peer review process of that being completed in March of 16. And then lastly, we anticipate bringing the, the diagnostic tool to staff and elected officials, hopefully in April of 2016, and plenty of time to have that be part of our biannual budget process discussions. Okay, I just have a, a somewhat of a concern with sure. step five. Sure. Um, as we're allocating resources based on priorities, if you look at the following slide, it heavily emphasizes alignment with citizen expectations. That's correct. But if we look at the timeline, we'll be utilizing this as a tool to assess priorities without that feedback. That's correct. The, the expectations that we've prepared first was using staff, departments, and elected officials. So okay. we've uh, gathered all the results based on internal, but using uh, involving the, the commissioners as well. So we feel like we do have some feel for what those results are going to be. And that's where the citizen engagement component will come in the future is to hopefully validate those results. There may be some changes in the future, but um, that that's kind of the approach that we took. So. We, we do not have the direct citizen input. We have it more through the elected officials at, at, at this time. Okay. Okay. And I could just speak personally. You know, I know that the people that we all serve, they vary greatly in opinion. And um, from looking at some of the processes that we have going on right now with the COP 2040 study, we also had the update to our um, CTP. It required, um, it was a multiple year process to get that public feedback sure. in determining the direction of the county. And I just want us to not, I know we wanna use this tool as a helpful tool. I would just caution us to be, not to be too aggressive in doing it without public feedback because even in the statement that we're looking to the public to validate it almost puts a slant on what the public's input is gonna be because they might have different priorities which might um, run counter to what we have internally sure. because we just see things from a different lens. So Absolutely. I would just encourage us, I'm, again, I'm, um, for us to have a very robust program in um, setting the priorities based off of that public feedback. Absolutely, and our results are broken down into internal results and external results. So safe and secure community would be one of our external results, but a lot of our departments within the county service other departments and that's where the citizen component won't come into play nearly as much. Okay. But all of those, like we'll have IS that may service, you know, obviously public safety, which would be feed into safe and secure and community, which those are the results that we'll want to identify and get confirmation from the citizens. Okay, very okay. good. And then just another observation too. I know we this has been um, a long time in the making, even started before um, me being here. And right now we're going through, if we haven't already gone through a process of polling um, persons internally to get their feedback on priorities. But it's very likely that priorities can even change on an annual basis, Absolutely. if not even shorter than that. And don't know if we have a mechanism to assess the changing priorities of the county and um, assessing how that's gonna feed into this tool that comes out. And, and that's one of the things that we've seen through other municipalities who've implemented is every uh, few years they'll go back and reevaluate their results or their goals to determine the priorities. Are they still relevant? Because they, as you said, they can change. And the nice thing is once the hardest part of this process is identifying the programs and scoring them. So if we change results, it's really a small transition. So the initial okay. implementation is where the bulk of the work or majority of the work will come in. After that, it's just an updating of the process. So it's, oh, yes. it's not nearly as time in intensive. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. The, the entire purpose of this process was to get us more in line with what the community wants mm -hmm. and is willing to pay for and to how much they're willing to pay for it. 
Um, prior to this process, we had a budgeting process where staff brought forward to us recommendations based on what their feedback was from commissioner and the community, what they thought the priority ought to be and where the emphasis ought to be in terms of not only programming type of program, but the funding associated with it. The purpose of this is to, to quantify more accurately, if you would, what we do have, the costs associated with it, the benefit that's provided by each, and if you would, a cost-benefit analysis for each individual service and what, in turn, the public can expect for that dollar invested in that particular program and enable us to be more responsive to the public. The initial program was is being weighed against our strategic plan that this board approved. And as we go forward, this is actually a step towards doing exactly what we need to be, but we need to go through this process of, as you say, self-evaluation, quantifying what we do have, the value associated with it versus the expense. And I think that's where this is where the board has been asking us to go to be more responsive. So I think this is exactly what we need to do to be more responsive to the community. Um, and I think this, the way we're going about it is accurate. Get our ducks in a row so we know, get our ducks in a row so we know exactly what it is we are providing, what the cost is, what the benefit is to it, and what's the cost-benefit analysis to that. So that we can make advice, we can present it to the public, and make them, they can then make a more informed decision as to what they want to they want to support. So it's a good job. You guys are working hard. The community will have an opportunity to weigh in, and as as every budget, every annual budget, we'll make adjustments based on priorities that are before us in that regard, um, as we have in the last five years. So good work to you. We appreciate your team, and we thank you so much. It's, um, it's kind of magic. Do you have anything you want to add to that? No, sir, Mr. Chair, and, uh, and going back to your comments and to Commissioner Cupid, the big, the largest workload has been trying to identify those programs and get them into the system. And once we get that diagnostic, to, we, for the first time, we'll have all of our programs in a system, and then you can go back and the changes will be much easier because you got them all in one place. So. Absolutely. So with that, nothing else, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So we are finished with our work session. We'll pick up tab number four tonight at our regular call meeting at 7 o'clock. Thank you.